we're going to get started now, and we're going to start with Dr. Vicki Seifert Margolis who's a Senior Advisor for Science Innovation and Policy in the FDA Commissioner's Office. Vicki's been an active member of our planning committee. She's also uh, tasked at the FDA with bringing innovation to the agency. So we're all looking forward to Vicki's remarks. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I'm going to try to keep you awake um, and talk about, talk about this issue around data and big data and what we can do in sort of terms of what we can do and what we are doing as opposed to what we can't do. So I think we've heard a lot about what we can't do today and how hard it is. Except for Richard, he was, he was giving us, I think, more optimistic, <laughs> ironically coming from the FDA. I just want to point that out. So. Um, um, I think that there's a lot we can do, there's a lot we are doing, and I don't think it's always really expensive, and I don't think it's always really hard. I think it's just about doing it. And I also think that we have to be mindful that what we're talking about here and building on the last session on standards, in my, in my mind, and this is my view, not necessarily official FDA view, but my view, having spent 10 years prior to coming to the FDA in academia doing analysis of large data sets and clinical data in a large clinical trials consortium. Now coming to the FDA and really working on how do we bring scientific computing to the agency and working closely with Eric uh, Praxis, our new CIO from j and I think we have to be creative and I think that we have to be flexible. Because if there was one thing I learned in 10 years of clinical trials in immune-mediated diseases is that the endpoints of 1999 didn't look at all like the endpoints of 2009. And so if you set out to try to predefine everything, you aren't going to be able to do it. And I would wager to say that the patient of 2012 in terms of how we characterize them, even for basic characteristics like race, which by the way are already giving us problems, and I'm going to show you some examples, um, are going to be fundamentally different when we start having genome sequence. And it's all, in my estimation, about what's the question and what's the experimental context. And having that context of the question and the experiment will drive how we look at data. And I think we have to just keep in mind that standards are important, and to the extent we can do as much to keep things as standard as possible, that's great. But with the knowledge and the full wherewithal, that what the question is that we're asking is going to drive how we look at the data, what fields we pull, and will also drive how we normalize that data. So I, I really think that this is a, a balancing act in large part. So I want to talk about a couple of efforts that have been underway at the FDA and sort of tell you qu quickly what is sort of the current state even with the study data tabulation model in hand. And let's take that as a given. We know 40% of the data is still coming in, maybe a little bit more on paper, and maybe not necessarily standardized. We also know that there are still a large number of reviewers, and maybe Eric's going to show this wonderful photo, that regardless of how the data is coming in, they print it out, and they tape it to the walls of their offices, and they look at it. So they're not necessarily availing themselves to the attributes of standardized data or advanced analytical tools or advanced visualization tools because it's not how they're used to doing it. So the underlying culture and process that exists in large organizations obviously plays a tremendous role in how well and how efficiently and effectively we actually can implement some of these changes. So right now, the sponsor sends TLFs, as was mentioned, and if they're doing it nicely, they send it to us in this nice STTM format, comes to the reviewer, the reviewer looks at it, and as I said, sometimes they're looking at it electronically, sometimes they're not, sometimes it's coming in in paper. But if they have questions, they're going back and they're asking the sponsor, basically. You know, many, many cases. And I spent a lot of time talking with statisticians and a lot of time talking with reviewers. And we don't have in our hands any way to nimbly look at the multidimensionality of our data. A lot of this data is still relatively flat. So ideally, what we'd want is more of what I call the, ooh, <laughs> not that, <laughs> the information, the information in a more raw format. And tools that allow us to compare trials 
and programmers that allow us to manage our data and allow us to take things out of SAS, pull the fields that we need based on what the question is that we're asking, and provide those in a format that's in a table that can be laid into advanced analytical tools, can be used by statisticians, et cetera. I spent a lot of time thinking about this part right here and what our reviewers are doing. And I can tell you, the statisticians are doing most of the programming. Statisticians are doing a large variety of the data quality work. And the data management layer at the agency is probably not as um, helpful as it could be. So we need to think hard about that. We also need to think about what kinds of things we can do to manipulate the data with advanced analytical tools and how we, once we move into this system of collecting data off of EMRs, if we, if, when we get there, how that's going to implement and how that will be rolled in to the process we currently have. Because right now the communication between sponsors and reviewers is probably not going to be the answer the way it's currently constructed. So I'm going to skip this slide. One of the things we did was we sort of did a comparison within the agency of two different use cases. One of them was we took the approach of taking legacy data and a lot of it, 101 NDAs. And we converted all of the data to a standardized format with no predetermined scientific question. Then we took another set of data. We took converted data or unconverted data. So we took this nice, clean, converted data that we did up here in the legacy data conversion, and we took data that was basically raw as we got it. And we said, can we answer a specific question using some tools? And the tool we chose is nothing all that magnificent, but it's a pretty reasonable tool called Amalga. It's a tool developed by Microsoft. It was actually developed for point of care um, data integration. But the idea was, how much can you buy with what I'll call normalization on the fly out of your raw data versus spending the time and energy. And the legacy data conversion pro process was expensive, both in time, um, people hours, and money. Um, and so that was the question we set out to ask. So for approach one, <clears throat> we supported the conversion of 101 legacy clinical trial data to the SDTM and ADAM formats to enable exploration of the data, basically um, patient-centered outcomes research. And this was part of a larger project, which was a $21 million project funded from Mer American Recovery and Reinvestment Act money. There were three key elements to this project. One was the creation of a clinical trial repository. That was a large project, and it was using a very, very standard data model approach. And Eric is going to tell you a little bit about how one of the things we've learned in this process is while there's value in that, we think that there are much more facile, cheaper, ways to do it with agile software development. The other piece of this was to actually convert the legacy data. And then the third piece of it was to engage in actual research on the data. And so we did that. We worked with Johns Hopkins University. We moved large amounts of data, 61 HIV combination NDAs, um, that we worked on collaboratively with Johns Hopkins University. We did it under contract and with an NDA, and we were able to fully share some of the lessons that we learned that I think are critical for all these efforts is that the subject matter expertise was, was key in enabling the Hopkins University team to be able to do the work they wanted to do. And it really required people within the FDA who had not only seen trial data from one company, but had actually seen trial data across the board from all of the filings that came in. So they had this incredible knowledge base to bring to the data and to, uh, and to bring in terms of understanding the protocols. I will tell you the Hopkins people were shocked when we sent them the protocols and the data. They had not seen data like this before, it's huge amounts of data. So in the legacy data conversion process, and I don't, I'm trying to be mindful of time, one of the things that was clear is it was important to understand the difference between this conversion activity and a sponsor's activities in support of regulatory submission, because we were trying to take all of the data, convert it so that it could be integrated and there could be multiple trials compared. So what did we learn? We learned that the scientific questions drive the details in the conversion, that clinical and scientific expertise is required to determine how to reorganize the data and how to fit it into whatever standard it is that you need to answer the question. Um, we learned that terminology dictionary harmonization requires clinical expertise. I can't underscore this enough, that we really need the reviewers and the subject matter experts in there to help. 
Statisticians were required to translate the questions into analyzable components, and quality control of the converted data is essential, but incredibly time consuming. Um, and we also learned that this activity of converting the data is intensive and expensive. This costs about $7 million. Data quality and harmonization are fundamental to successful data analysis, but it's not clear that you can predetermine everything that you want to in terms of a standard. Standardization does not ensure quality. I think this is a key point because we saw a lot of standard stuff come in, but it wasn't high quality. We saw very standardized files of patient initials. We saw files of in three different languages that were highly standardized, where reviewers were Googling to translate back into English, the case report forms. We saw a lot of interesting stuff around racial categor categorization. I th and this is something one would think is straightforward, but is actually not. So, what would happen is if there were five racial fields and there was a, a mix, say half Latino, half African American, they would be put into a column. That information, the person would be coded as either African American or Latino, and then there'd be this extra information about them in some other column in this sort of additional information field, which became quite complicated when we started looking through it. So even though it was quote unquote standardized and we were checking off categories of race, it didn't ensure quality because those particular categories were not capturing what was actually the racial identity of the patients. So if not done well, conversion to a standard format has the potential to adversely affect data quality and analysis. We really have to, again, know what we're asking and what we want to ask of the data and what the context is to be able to get out of the data what we need to answer the question. Standardization does not imply that data is fit for purpose. Standardized data may or may not answer our questions, may be useful or not useful for future analysis. Can converted data be so fit for a specific purpose that it's not otherwise useful? These are all issues that came up over the course of three years of really digging into data and looking at it. And in some instances, conversion to a standard, especially when converting data for a specific goal or purpose, resulted in a loss of traceability from the source. So in, st in standardizing, we were losing information that we thought was important because we were making assumptions about the data that actually took some of the information that was informative out of it. So I think these are all things to be mindful of as we think about how we look at data and how the assumptions that we make as we move forward in these processes. So the other thing I think that's important is that we saw a lot of extraneous stuff coming in. And one thing is clear is that not all the collected data that is going on out there needs to come to the FDA. It's really just clogging the system. And in fact, I think electronic submission is going to make this worse rather than better. Because at least what was happening before is trucks and pallets were coming in on paper. Now we're getting filings that would, I'm told actually from a, a, a farmer, a pharma person that one of their submissions they estimated would be paper piled to the height of the Empire State Building. But they were able to send us everything because it was electronic. So the question is, do we want all that? <laughs> and what are we going to do with it? And somebody has to look at it. So ideally, initial study planning phases should exclude data that the FDA does not need or want. We don't want subject initials. In some instances, the original data was unnecessarily confusing. So as I said, the original term gypsy was converted to unknown. And that was one of the fields that came in as an identifier, gypsy. So <laughs> some parting thoughts um, are shown here. The standard should be implemented in the same way across studies. You need to create business rules. It allows for identification of areas for improvement. Standardization will not solve all of the problems with study data. It may illuminate them, but that we need to really think hard about what we want to do with the data and what the questions are that we're asking of the data. So very quickly, in approach tool, we, two, we used a tool that basically allowed us to take data out of a variety of formats, text form, fa formats, imaging files, XML files, and we created parsers that transform the data on the fly, depending on the questions that we were asking of the data. And we did a use case, and this was to take data out of CDRH. It was a one-year pilot, which culminated in the successful integration and analysis of dis disparate regulatory data sets, including post-market and pre-market data being integrated together. And basically, I don't have time to go into this, but what we found is that we were able to integrate post-market and pre-market data. We were able to learn a lot of new interesting things from the data, depending on the question we were asking, using this approach. And we feel that 
some combination of using some st level of standardization and advanced tools that allow you to integrate data and do analysis on the fly, as they say, are probably necessary to really help us move forward in these advanced analytics, whether it be multiple clinical trial integration studies or even for single product applications. And these are just some of the challenges that we encountered and some of the efforts that are underway. So one of the things that we've learned is that it's hard to know on the, on the parser side how many SQL queries you have to write and how you're going to set them up for sort of pre-canned queries depending on your data. So you need to have people who can help you with that and who can take the questions, who can understand what the data is that's coming in and then how to parse. But we've also learned that there are some processes in review that are highly repeated um, and that there are opportunities to actually pre-write some of those uh, queries to enable us to flexibly integrate multiple types of data without having to go to all the time to pre-standardize it. So again, I think it's going to be some mixture, and I think Eric will probably follow on with some of those thoughts. Are we taking questions now? Or? And I'll close because I'm out of time. Thank you.